Architecture, History, and Theory in Reverse was published in 2017. Help me welcome Jason Callender. All for coming. Um, you know, my nerves were building up for the last hour, and in the last 10 minutes, several students have shown up, so this is even more unnerving. Um, uh, thank you all for coming. Um, the work that I'm going to present today is based on a class that I found myself teaching about 15 years ago. Uh, I came to Mississippi State in 2004. In 2006, I was moved to uh, the Jackson Center, which is, if you haven't visited our building, we're just around the corner at 509 East Capitol Street. And um, for two years, I worked under uh, the previous director, a guy named David Biggie. When David left, uh, I inherited his class, Theory of Urban Design. The problem is I don't, didn't know anything about what urban design was. Um, and I had an interest in sustainability. I have always had an interest in placemaking. And I tried to fuse those two things in this class. And um, the handful of people here who are here who were in the early versions of the class will know that um, I tried to organize the class as a true exploration. We were going to figure out this content together. And um, the students, I have to say, were formative of the ideas that I will talk about today. Uh, three in particular, um, Whitney Grant, uh, uh, Brian Norwood, and Nick Hester, really helped me formulate the beginnings of this book. And that would have been in 2008, 2009. So I will begin with, this is um, the cover of the book. Um, the idea for the book came about only in the last um, about six years. Once the, the, I had sort of taught this class several times and we had begun to figure out a method for thinking through these ideas that use Jackson as kind of the, the root material, um, I presented this to the, my publisher shortly after the first book came out with the idea that somebody should write this book. I submitted a proposal that said somebody should write this book. And uh, that survey went into the ether for about two years. And then the publisher reached out and said, are you ready to write this book? Um, I, I said yes, even though I'm not sure that was true. First, before we really get into the content, though, I want to be clear about something. I've thought mostly in the last uh, 15 years about how these big ideas work together, about how um, uh, mobility and shelter and food and water come together to make a sustainable city. Um, that um, is an area that, none of these areas are areas that I personally have deep uh, expertise in. So when it was time to write the book, uh, I knew I wanted to organize the book in two parts. There would be what I would call the essentials. Every chapter starts with a 2,500, 3,000 word essentials, which talks about the various aspects of building sustainable cities in sort of big, broad terms. And then most of the sentences in that essentials chapter are linked to what I call the fine print. And when it came to time to write the fine print, I don't have the depth of expertise to write some of these. Uh, I know a little bit about all of them, um, but there are limits. So I invited four uh, current and former colleagues to join me in this. Dr. Joan Blanton, who's sitting here, uh, helped me write the mobility section of the fine print. Um, her background is she is a certified urban planner and teaches at Jackson State and Mississippi State University, teaches my old third theory of urban design course. Uh, Caleb Crawford, he's an architect in New York who used to teach at Mississippi State. Uh, he is a certified passive house designer and uh, he agreed to write the buildings component of this. Uh, Taz Fulford, who is a professor of landscape architecture at Mississippi State, uh, whose expertise is in food and food cultivation, uh, joined me for food. And Corey Gallo, um, whose area of expertise is wastewater management, uh, and who's a landscape architect at Mississippi State, joined us to deal with the sections on water. So I want to be clear that what I'm presenting today, a lot of the deep knowledge is not from me, it's from others. And second, uh, I'm going to breeze over a lot of deep content that those experts would all be offended by if they heard it. 
So the first question, and this is the way I would typically start my class each year, was ask, I would ask the students, what is sustainability? What does it mean to be sustainable? And surprisingly, even though we have fifth-year architecture students who have been doing this a long time, they've had four years of education, and we've heard about sustainability throughout our lives, people had a hard time answering that question. And then when I would ask them, what is a sustainable building? Well, they would have a few more answers, but it was still vague. And when I would say, what is a sustainable city, sustainable urbanism? Uh, there were blank looks. So we would work through this question, and this is, I want to be clear, not something that students don't know. This is not a lack of knowledge of students. This is pervasive. Um, this is from LinkedIn just a few days ago. A, um, Stephanie Blank, who uh, works in the building construction industry with focus on sustainability, she asked this question. She asked a group of friends, what is a sustainable building? And people talk about planted facades and solar roofs and timber and tiny houses. And she says, well, no, really, it's all of this other stuff. It's about renovating buildings. It's about densifying. And so the general public doesn't get these concepts. And the blame can't stop there. Um, our own profession has problems with this. My own profession of architecture has problems defining sustainability. This is from an issue of uh, Architectural Record, which is the Journal of the American Institute of Architects. And this is a collection of images showing sustainable solutions in the southeast. Um, these are interesting little buildings. Uh, they're small. Uh, they probably have recycled materials in them. They probably have a small um, uh, ecological footprint. But I don't know that these are models for the way most people can live. And it's, this is a really important concept. We're not talking about sustainability if we're not talking about a way that most people could live and we would still be sustainable. Um, there is, um, at, at the last time I presented this material, at, at the end there was a question about, well, what, is, what, do, what do you think about uh, sustainable huts and sustainable cabins off the grid? And I think they're fine um, for the people who want to, to play the game of sustainability. Um, it is kind of an elitist view of sustainability. Those who can afford 40 acres or 20 acres out in the middle of nowhere and can afford to live that life, I guess it is sustainable in some measure. But the problem is we have to house, maybe by the end of this century, 10 billion people. 10 billion people can't all have their own 20 acres. Uh, the math just doesn't work. So to deal with the fact that we don't know <laughs> what sustainability is, a lot of metrics have evolved. There are a, a ton of these sorts of things. Uh, these are the ones most prevalent in the US. If you go around the world, the number of these emblems and logos multiply. And one problem with most of these metrics is, it come, I come back to a, a quote by a physicist, P.W. Anderson, who says, the whole becomes not only more than, but very different from the sum of its parts. When you take this kind of metric approach where you just fill it, you check enough boxes and you have sustainability, it's, the assumption is that it's purely additive. If you check enough boxes, you have achieved something that can last. So the idea of synergy, or the idea of how these things reinforce one another or make each other better, gets lost in that, in that mix. The most, common, um, the most common metric, the one that I think we all know, or most of us know, is lead. There are lead buildings in Jackson. Uh, you can find the lead plaque in front of many buildings. Um, and LEED has done a lot to improve the way we think about building the world. One issue with LEED is, as any numerical system, people start trying to game it. So without mentioning a name of a firm or the name of a building or the city, uh, I visited a LEED certified building in Mississippi not long ago. And as I walked around, I noticed that I was in a pre-engineered metal building designed to last about 20 years, 25. And I started wondering, well, how is this, how is this sustainable? 
Well, the designer walked me in and showed me a room full of all this technology. And this technology makes this thing very energy efficient. I said, okay. And I said, how else is this energy efficient or how is this uh, sustainable? Well, he said, in LEED, you get credit if you put in a bike rack and you put in a shower because it encourages people to bike to work. Now, standing outside, this building is in a small town in a green field. Nobody lives within range to bike there. So they were getting points for something that would never happen. And in fact, you could argue that they were giving up some of the sustainable potential of the project because they were wasting materials to put in a shower and a bike rack. Um, I did learn after that that the company that built the building bought a bus for the local community because they wanted to get credit for the building being on a mass transit route. Um, and so I have some skepticism about systems like this. So when I worked with students in this theory of urban design class, uh, I would often ask pretty early on, what does the city have to provide? What are the bare essentials? And let's start from there. You gotta be able to feed people. You gotta be able to produce food and get it to them. You have to provide clean water for cooking, for cleaning, for um, the, the various needs of a city, manufacturing. You have to provide quality shelter, a way to protect people and let them live meaningful lives in close proximity to one another. And, and you have to deal with issues of mobility. How do people get from one place to another? I'm not sure why I jumped. Um, these four needs are the basis of any sustainable future. These are things that no matter how people change or what technologies emerge, these four basic things are going to be required. So the next part of the question is what makes something capable of lasting? What makes something last? What are the metrics we might really use? And the first one is life cycle, literally. Um, how long can something last? Um, the second, and th this is the one that gets overlooked a lot, is aesthetics. Do people want it to last? Because there are a lot of things that get built that could last, but people hate it to the point that it gets renovated or torn down within a few years or 10 years or 20 years. And at that point, it doesn't matter if it was sustainable in some sort of metric uh, if people don't like it, it won't stay around. Then there are issues of scale, and we'll get into this in a moment as well. Scale is how much footprint do you take up? How much ground does your life literally occupy? And what are the economies of scale? What are the values of us building bigger or building closer together? And finally, technology. And I won't, I'll hit on this again at the end of the presentation, but Technology for me, and I think for many others, is at first glance, it is what we identify as being sustainable when we see solar panels and that stuff. But technology in some ways comes last. It literally comes last in the sort of things that we have to do to make a, a viable future for ourselves. Technologies applied to sustain, really sustainable planning can be incredibly valuable to us. Technologies applied to the bad planning that we often use in suburbia today, big parking lots and big box stores, we are like the people who put the shower and the bike rack in the middle of nowhere. We're wasting materials. So in 2012, um, I developed the first version of what I call the last matrix. Last meaning life cycle, aesthetic, scales, technology. And measured it against these areas of need, so energy, food, mobility, shelter, water. Uh, various classes pursued this in various ways. Um, some classes made films, some people uh, wrote, uh, some conducted interviews. But all of that w fed this sort of larger discussion about how can these things synergistically work together to make a future, um, make, make a city that we would hope would last to, into the future. So. I'm gonna run through the four 
uh, my four metrics really fast. And if anybody has a question, um, feel free to ask, and I will pretend to answer your question. Um, the first is life cycle. And in some ways, that should be the most obvious. Um, literally, if you want something to last, you have to build it to last. Um, in a lot of talk about sustainable urbanism and sustainable buildings, however, uh, life cycle has, sh has shifted into a conversation about uh, recycling and recyclability. So we imagine if we build buildings out of recycled materials or things that could be recycled, the building we can be taken apart and therefore it reduces the environmental material need for the next version of that building that comes down the road and the next version when it gets re, uh, reconfigured. Um, you know, the, the Thoreau quote here about the life that you exchange for your decisions is an important one. Every time that we take a building apart and take its recyclable parts away, we have to transport. There's the energy of taking the building apart. Then there's the energy to transport those materials. There's the energy involved in repurposing those materials. There's the energy involved in transporting those materials back to a new site and reinstalling them. We trap ourselves in this cycle where we think that because a thing can be reused, it has limited or even no environmental cost. And oftentimes, I think the environmental cost of recycled and recycled, so recyclable buildings is very high. So I often present a picture of this building to the students and ask, is this a sustainable building? And if you are in the sort of current day mindset of what sustainability is, which is low embodied energy, low initial cost, uh, recyclability, the Pantheon in Rome is not a, a sustainable building. On the other hand, um, this is a building that has been there for 2,000 years serving exactly the same purpose. It has very high embodied energy, um, but it still serves one function. And so if you divide the embodied energy, the amount of materials, the amount of human labor involved in building it, by 2,000 years, this thing starts to feel really sustainable in a meaningful way. And if you imagine that it might last another 2,000 years, um, I suspect this building would rate very high in sort of a larger metric of sustainability. And just to be clear, this is not about uh, the great buildings of the world. Um, we have buildings that have extraordinary life cycles right here in Jackson. So Bailey Magnet School from, I think, 1938 is a cast-in-place concrete, some people call it fortress. Um, I, I think it's a really amazing, beautiful building. And the reason I include it today is 30 years ago, I had the privilege of walking through this building the first time. And the principal at the time walked around with me, and she explained that she would really like to see it torn down. And because she, she had seen other schools that were building these new red brick on concrete block buildings with green metal roofs. And she really thought it'd be nice to have that here instead. And when I look back now, 30 years later, I realize it had that happened, had this been torn down and that red brick building put in its place, we would already be investing in renovating and restoring that building. And here's a building that is closing in on 100 years old. And even if it needs renovation or needs to be repurposed for something else, the bones of this building are substantial. So in the fine print section of Life Cycle, um, we began to look at what needs to last, what needs to be here, what needs to be capable of being here in 100 years, 200 years, 300 years. And so the diagram at the top says, beyond the site, beyond the piece of land in which we build, the next most important thing is we have to start building structures that don't require modification or addition or change. And then the skin of the building, the actual enclosure on the outside is the next most prominent element. 
And as you work your way in, those elements we know are going to change over time. So services, uh, mechanical systems, lighting systems, and the space plan, the way we divide up the space with walls, all of that is going to change radically over time. And the stuff that the owner decides to put in will change year to year. But we need to provide buildings that don't require our intervention to be here. In life cycle, we also then look at water. And so we talk a lot about the hydraulic cycle. Uh, how long does it take water to move through its sort of normal hydraulic cycle? And are there ways that we can slow that down so that we maybe figure out ways to reuse water multiple times before it re-enters the ocean and is evaporated and goes back into the system? We talk about mobility and the importance of understanding that transit is not just a thing that you build. Transit is not the thing that you just invest enough money to buy the buses and the, the trams. But you have to understand the financing that goes behind it so that it is self-sustaining to some extent. And we talk about food. And the life cycle of food, food is a, is a consumable. It obviously will go away. But we can build the infrastructure by which food is restored on a year-to-year -year basis. So this is where green walls and stacked vertical gardening uh, comes in. And it also is about looking for places where we already have protected zones of land, places like the medians of highways, the medians of major streets, as places that, if planted correctly, could be productive for the future. And then we talk a little bit about heirloom varieties, the importance of using varieties of plants that have proven themselves capable of sustaining themselves without the need for um, lots of fertilizer and intervention on our part. So I return to the, um, the Pantheon, and after we discuss the Pantheon in class and talk about it's a great building, it's a sustainable building because it's been there for 2,000 years. The question is, why has it lasted 2,000 years? Beyond its you know, obvious um, quality of construction. And because there are a lot of buildings that were well constructed 2,000 years ago that no longer exist in the world. Well, one of them, one of the reasons, one of the chief reasons here is the importance of the thing to its community. Right? It, is an, it is a beautiful place, and the function of this as a place for worship, um, its existence as a symbolic marker of the neighborhood, all of those things contribute to it being preserved, whereas other things of similar quality, of similar time, were dismantled and recycled. And... You know, the, the great spaces of the world, the spaces that we tend to want to visit uh, when we travel, that many of us travel to, um, what is the success of the place? It is the fact that it has an identity. It has a clear sense of place. And again, that's not just the great cities of Europe. There are extraordinary pieces of infrastructure right here. Uh, this is Lamar Life, 1924, uh, I believe. Um, one of the most beautiful buildings, I think, in the city. Uh, maybe one of the most beautiful buildings in the state of Mississippi. So when we think about aesthetics, aesthetics also is not just about buildings. Aesthetics is about water and food and mobility. So there's a lot of water infrastructure that we have to have in the world. We have to deal with um, site runoff, we have to deal with waste, we have to deal with drinking water and moving it. And there have been many civilizations over history that have done this well, so that that infrastructure isn't just hidden in pipes and tanks on tops of buildings, but that infrastructure is put to use in ways that enhance the lives of the people around it. Um, canals in Amsterdam, obviously uh, the great aqueducts of Rome, and in food, remember when I said that uh, aesthetics isn't just about beauty. Aesthetics is about quality of place. Um, so on the one hand, you have 
you know, uh, I think this is a market in Istanbul. Um, there is kind of a beauty to this, but there's also a sense of community, right? This is where I go to meet people, to rub shoulders, to buy food. And then these are uh, farms actually in Mississippi um, where the goal isn't necessarily the beauty of the food, but it's about teaching kids the value of food and the value of producing their own food and being local consumers. And then there's the aesthetic component of the identity that we adopt as a nation, right? So when the Victory Gardens were, um, came into being during the wars, the Victory Gardens were aimed at, in part, feeding the population, right? Everybody could produce their own garden in their backyard. But in some ways, it was symbolic of who we are as a people, that we are more than, um, we are more than consumers. We give back to our neighborhood. So we talk about in the book the ways that the food aesthetic is something that would generate um, or would help us be long-lasting and be actually more productive in our future. And finally, uh, we talk about mobility and aesthetics. So if you look on the right, sorry, if you look on the right, um, this is a diagram of a streetscape. We can begin to think about how sidewalks, for instance, provide places for um, the economy of the building, the life of a building to spill out on the street. So you've got, you know, places for people to sit. Then you have to have a place for people to walk and you know, sort of enjoy the city, a zone for just sitting and enjoying the world, a zone for biking. And then on the left is Venice. Um, we live in a place that is, an ex to a very high degree, asphalt. Um, we have a world of parking and a world of roads around us. And, you know, this, in Venice at least, serves as <laughs> a means of communication, a means of movement. Um, movement doesn't have to mean um, cars. The third metric is the idea of scale. And it is the hardest one for some people to get. Um, because... Uh, I, I reference E.O. Wilson uh, a lot. I was reading E.O. Wilson before I even started teaching this class. Um, but, you know, this line right here, um, that a recent study estimated that the human population exceeded the Earth's sustainable capacity around the year 1978. We are in a lot of trouble. And Wilson later published a book called Half Earth, um, I'm here to, I guess, plug my book, but if you have not read Half Earth, that is the book everybody here should actually read. Um, in Half Earth, Wilson makes an argument that assuming that we have something like 15.8 billion acres of habitable land on this planet, a lot, but a finite amount, Wilson says, we've got to leave at least half of that for other plants and other animals if we want to be truly sustainable. Um, reserving the corner of a park for wild animals or wild plants, there's nothing sustainable about that. that is our, that's there for our entertainment. Um, to be truly sustainable, you have to give and other species at least half this planet. And so when you start doing the math, 15.7 billion acres, cut that number in half. And you imagine by the end of this century, we might have 10 billion people. This number right here is really terrifying. Um, we should figure out a way to live on less than 7.9 acres a person. And, you know, I, I live on a half acre, so I could imagine, I tell myself, oh, I'm already there. Well, my food isn't produced on that acre, half acre. Um, my car isn't built on that half acre. It doesn't, doesn't drive on that half acre. I don't go to work on that half acre. I don't go out and walk my dogs on that half acre. Um, I don't know what my actual footprint is, but it's many times this. And I suspect it's many times that number for most people in the room. So that's the question for you. How much land do you currently occupy in the world? And the reason I thought this was important enough to put in the book is 
The image on the left um, is an aerial photograph from something called Solar Decathlon. Solar Decathlon is a annual competition amongst schools of architecture and engineering uh, where they try to compete against one another to design a purely self-sustaining single-family house. And, you know, there's a, lot, there's a lot of good research that comes out of this. Um, the model is each, each team brings their prefabricated house to one site and they erect it so that visitors get to walk through them and see the latest thinking about how to be sustainable. And as far as that goes, it makes sense. Um, I can't help but notice that this, sorry, this image and that image, which is Rochester circa 1950, look about the same. This is the beginning of, the image on the right is the beginning of sort of gross urban sprawl, right, suburbia. And you could say that the people doing the solar decathlon, it wasn't one of their challenges to think about the patterns in which we live. And I would say that's exactly the problem. They're not taking the real problem to heart. So another thought exercise from those early classes, I asked students, if you tried to take the city of Jackson in its current density, the way we build now, the way Jackson looks today if you walk outside, and you evaluate that city and say, if it had to house the 37 million people of Tokyo in the patterns in which we build, how big would Jackson have to grow? It would cover about 55% of the state of Mississippi. We often see ourselves as detached from the problems of sustainability, that the way we live is fine. I am not hurting the environment. When we accept the way we live, we are contributing to the problem. And I, I will also add, um, if you think this is bad, run the same diagram for most of the other towns in Mississippi. At the opposite end of the spectrum, I asked the students, if you, have, if you were to rebuild a, or build a city with the density of New York, how big would it be to house the whole population of the state of Mississippi? And if we built at that density, we could house the entire population of the state of Mississippi in a one mile wide strip along I-55 between Jackson and Grenada. And again, this is, not in, this is not freakish density. If you redid this diagram for the population density of Tokyo, you cut about a third off that line. If you re-ran the diagram for the density of Mumbai, the line gets cut in half. There are ways that we could save a lot more ground than we do if we're committed to doing so. So the book then looks at the issues of scales from, again, the shelter perspective, um, literally how do we build denser, but more importantly, what are the gains and benefits of building denser? So if I live, sorry, if I live in that box, I have to heat and cool my entire volume. I have to heat and cool the walls that surround me and the roof that is above me. If I live in that box, or that box, or that box, or even to some extent that box, I only have to heat and cool, well, I have to heat and cool fewer sides of my space. The School of Architecture currently is adjacent to an abandoned building on Capitol Street. Um, I would love for any occupant to come and occupy the building next door because suddenly my air conditioning doesn't have to cool the big wall that separates the two of us, right? We would share that load. But unfortunately, we tend to build in isolated ways where we think of every wall and every roof and every surface as being independent of everybody else. So it not only means we spend more money on materials because I now have to build that wall twice, um, I've got to heat my space, you have to heat yours. Um, we look at issues of mobility. Um, you know, in great cities, I never, um, I typically don't rent a car, but I enjoy walking in cities. The reason I can do that is most cities are built at a density that 
supports that. Uh, it makes sense. Um, where I'm currently at in Jackson, um, there are only a few things that I can get to that are in a reasonable walking distance. We can rethink our water and mechanical systems so that they begin to share at a district level. Um, rainwater gets recycled, gets uh, put back through as f irrigation for the site. Um, building systems, uh, the water, the gray water and system and the buildings can get cleaned and reused on the site as well. And these things become sort of objects in the landscape potentially. Um, this is the image on the left is Portland. Uh, the image on the right is Texas somewhere. Um, and water here it gets reintroduced into the city and it's kept local. And then food. Uh, I'm not one of those sustainable people who says we should no longer eat bananas because they have to be shipped. But if we understand food zones better, we could begin to parse out what should we produce here close because shipping it doesn't make sense because shipping it is cost prohibitive. There are things that we can produce in our own city um, that has a hard time holding up if we ship it from a thousand miles away. Those things we don't need to be trying to ship. And so the book looks at ways that we can reuse the land around us with uh, food forest and again working in the, in the medians and swells along the highway to actually put those things into use so we are maximizing the potential of the land around us. And finally, and I'm running a little behind, um, technologies. This is where, where most people want to start the conversation about sustainable buildings and sustainable cities. It's the end for me. Um, solar panels are what everybody immediately thinks of, but I again turn to E.O. Wilson, and he points out that uh, the, to the extent that we depend on prosthetic devices to keep ourselves in the biosphere alive, we will render everything fragile. So he lists the, the problem here as the dual need for decarbonization. We want to get carbon out of the air. We want to make these technologies that reduce our reliance on uh, burning fossil fuels. But on the other hand, the other half of sustainability, we have to use less materials. And you can't make these things that decarbonize without using materials. So the book then quickly again looks at shelter, food, water, mobility. Um, in terms of shelter, the building on the left is uh, lovingly called the Gherkin in London by Foster Partners. And the reason it's here is this innovative, what seems like an aesthetic decision to make the structural grid in a diamond actually reduces the materials required to hold this building up by 30%. So 30% savings on materials by building this way. But the book doesn't only look at sort of high-tech ways to solve these problems. We look at sort of the everyday, the mundane, um, providing a continuous air barrier. If we just did that for every house that we build, we could reduce the need for running mechanical systems all the time. And we give examples of how these calculations are done and where resources are to support those decisions. Um, in terms of water, the, I'm sorry, in terms of food, the image on the right is the new aquaponics garden at O'Hare International Airport, where they are producing their own food. I, I can't remember the number now, but it's something like 30% of food within uh, O'Hare will be self-grown within some time frame. And the image on the left is actually FarmBot, which is a uh, agricultural robot at Mississippi State University, which is being used to plant and test um, um, uh, the, the various species to monitor their water needs and fertilizer growth and all that stuff. And finally, uh, water. Um, the image on the right deals with um, drip lines really simple, dumb technology. We don't need to be spraying uh, to irrigate our plants anymore. The thing on the left is the roof of the Science Museum in San Francisco by Renzo Piano, uh, where the roof is designed to actually control water, to direct it, to preserve the water that is collected on site and put it to new use. And it's interesting, this 
this graphic that seemed up to date when the book came out um, is <laughs> ridiculously out of date already. But that point actually makes it, you know, it actually makes my point that um, we need to be looking at alternative fuels in terms of our mobility systems. Uh, fossil fuels are not the way of the future. So to kind of sum this up, um, I do think that technologies have to come last in thinking about a sustainable future. Um, if we get the other, the other things right, uh, the technologies can be a real benefit to us. But if we don't get the basic planning decisions right, um, the technologies are not that useful. And we have an extraordinary um, group of buildings here. We have an inc incredible infrastructure that is waiting for us to both adapt and to add to. Um, it's a, one of my fav favorite quotes by the former president of the AIA, the greenest building is the one that already exists. Um, sometimes in our urge to build more sustainable futures, we demo the things that are already in the way or that we perceive as being in the way. So the matrix, and with the book ends with a discussion of how to use the matrix, the argument is make your projects work together so that uh, in terms of life cycle, aesthetic scales, technologies, you're doing a series of projects that benefit one another. Because oftentimes when we, are, uh, when we think we're making sort of a sustainable stride, we develop, some, we develop a farmer's garden in one corner of the city and we develop uh, a transit system that only accesses another part of the city. Unless those things are coordinated, their benefits are largely lost. And any real significant future involves us coordinating all of these projects into one vision. Thank you. I, I, believe, I believe that Chris is gonna walk around now with uh, the microphone. Yeah, we have time for questions. If anyone has a question, raise your hand. And we'll I'll tell you, I'm going to jump start with you. I don't have a question. I have a comment. Okay. I was struck by the quote from McKibben's, mm. community is inefficient. Mm. And when we look at the old world, community is what built those structures that have lasted 2,000 years. But the idea that community is inefficient goes against logic. Um, does it? Um, I, I think, uh, yeah, I think if that, that's a good point. Uh, if you look back at how did these things get built, um, the great buildings of sort of history, um, there was a sense, th my sense is that they didn't think in terms of efficiency. Um, and once the thing is built, there's a, there's, there's, we develop this love for it that perpetuates. Um, so I don't know if I actually agree with McKibben that uh, community is essentially an exercise in inefficiency, but I think community is often grounded in initial decisions that weren't generated by simple efficiencies. Does that make sense? Probably not. Hey, I was just wondering if um, you've been able to share some of these ideas with um, policymakers and city planners and specifically our state legislature because... Um, <laughs> Some of your ideas about sustainability and mm -hmm. connecting it with the city of Jackson, I think um, if there was a way that these ideas could be communicated to them, perhaps you know more folks can kind of understand the importance of making sure that our capital city um, has all that it needs to move forward in the future. Well, thank you. Um, uh, if anybody can make that connection, that sounds great. Uh, yeah, you guys are the first big group that I've presented to, so um, I'm at the beginning of the book the book promotion, but uh, I would love to get these ideas in front of policymakers. I have mostly presented these ideas in the past at conferences, so I'm talking to planners and architects, um, landscape architects, people who, for the most part, already sort of know some of this, uh, but they're not in a position to do anything about it. So yes, I think you're right. It'd be nice to get this in front of the people who are making decisions. We have a question from the live stream. Um, Bill Justice says, what about maintenance and life cycle costs? The cost of a thing includes the life of its systems and components, 
including the structure, the cost of maintenance, both cyclic and at key lifespan replacement moments. Mm -hmm. Steel reinforced concrete has a life. That life can be lengthened or shortened by performing or deferring cyclic and recurring maintenance. Isn't an analysis of the long-term costs of all of that key to determining true sustainability? Yes, um, absolutely. We, we talk in the book about um, a life cycle cost analysis and the importance of doing that on every project. Um, that, that being said, um, I think oftentimes the buildings that we build are capable of lasting much longer than they, they do. Um, and so part of, part of what we have to do is educate people, educate people on the importance of maintenance. But the other side of that is if you look at the, the new model, the current model for developing buildings, the developer-driven model is, you know, a 20-year lifespan is great because by that point, everybody's made their money and it doesn't matter if it falls down at that point. Uh, I was stunned, I will say something negative about my own university at this point. Um, the university spent in the last 20 years a lot of money tearing down co uh, masonry and concrete dorms and replaced them with developer-like apartment buildings, wood-framed, that are projected to have a meaningful 20-year lifespan. Um, there's n nothing in the world that you can say that will make me think that that is a meaningful and important move. It seems wrong-headed to me. I miss the boomerang dorms. Yeah. Former students can't ask questions. <laughs> <clears throat> um, you mentioned in the slideshow about culture and about community and environments. Mm -hmm. People live in Mississippi because they want to live how people in Mississippi live. And people live in New York because they want to live how people mm -hmm. in New York live. How do you combat uh, changing the culture of an environment to kind of meet that efficiency? I think that that's actually a good question. Um, um, I would say that um, I've, I've heard this argument and I think in general it's true. If you, if you truly crave um, the nature of Manhattan, you should just move there. Jackson isn't going to change fast, and it isn't going to change in your lifetime to make you happy in that way. Um, however, I think it is possible, again, it's a, it's a question of education and presenting the possibilities. I think um, one thing that the book aims to do is suggest that living a slightly denser lifestyle with these amenities within reach could enhance Mississippi's environment as it is, right? It doesn't mean throwing out the community as it, as it is today. Um, yeah, it's, that's, a, that's a hard, that's a grind. Um, I am from Mississippi and I <clears throat> know the obstacles we face. In cases where cities have already sprawled, how do you de-urbanize, or is that even part of the goal? If all buildings, you know, if the, the best building is an existing building, mm -hmm. what do you do about possible already constructed infrastructure that might be very leaky from a sustainability standpoint? Yeah, um, that, yeah that's a challenge. Uh, and I think one, one solution is, and some, a few cities have looked at it, and it's actually reducing their own footprint literally withdrawing their political boundaries and saying, well, you have a building now, but it's no longer ours. It's no longer our problem. And that doesn't sound like a, that doesn't sound like a smart solution until you start like, really looking carefully at numbers and what it means. Um, the city can only support, you know, with its tax dollars, a certain amount of ground area and, and really make meaningful investments in a small footprint. And when the city retracts its services and its protections, oftentimes what happens is there's either abandonment or we accept that these buildings sort of get, the, the Wild West starts to happen and some new development moves into those places. Um, I think the, the author is, I think his name is Brugman. He talked a lot about the idea of the value of suburbs jumping outside city boundaries, developing a strong pod away from the city, 
and that sometimes what happens between the city and that, that pot is at when, when prices start to crunch people, it forces development in the middle. And I think there are ways that cities can shrink their footprint to encourage that kind of growth in the middle in that, in that sort of weak zone. That answered the question, maybe? Yeah. Another question from the live stream. Um, how do you think about the challenge of short-term political cycles as it relates to sustainability planning? <laughs> um, our, yeah, uh, that, um, in, in the city of Jackson, I, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn to say this, um, there was at the beginning of, of, the, of Lumumba's administration, a real redevelopment of the city planning office. We saw a new director, we saw several really amazing young um, people come in, and there was this incredible energy. And this doesn't even really speak to the problem of the short-term cycle. Literally halfway through his first term, everybody is sort of done with the, the political side of the world, and everybody wants to step out of those roles. And so for two years, we had this incredible energy in the city planning office. And I really hope I'm not saying the wrong thing. It, now, today, it's back to pre lumumba operating policy. And I don't know how you create this uh, sort of a long-lived political system here, um, something that will outlive an individual, an individual's leadership. Um, I will say that the director, the city planning director who came in during that time, uh, Mukesh Kumar, a good friend of mine, um, you know, I think he out-progressived the mayor when it came to think, rethinking the city. And again, it goes back to the question of how do you get buy-in in a community? How do you even get buy-in from our current leadership? Um, I think it's going to require, again, I keep, I keep saying this, and I feel like it's the easy answer, but it's going to require a re-education process. At some point, the politicians have to learn what the ultimate consequences of these decisions are. Does the School of Architecture at Mississippi State University have any official partnerships or relationships with, say, Main Street, Mississippi, or with towns and municipalities around the state? We, we do. Um, uh, for those who are interested, um, I would actually encourage you to look at our website. Uh, we have two research centers. Uh, one, the Carl Small Town Center, which is located in Sarkville works with Main Street and works with a lot of municipalities, especially in the Delta, um, trying to provide design support for communities that otherwise would not be able to afford them. And we have the Gulf Coast Community Design Studio, which is in, well, moving now to uh, Gulfport, uh, which works with communities all along the Gulf Coast. Um, and it was established right after Hurricane Katrina to help with rebuilding. Um, and they are also uh, associated with Main Street. Do you have any other questions? Oh. Um, I'm fascinated by this. I think the one thing you haven't addressed, though, and I'm sure you do, and I haven't read your book yet, is that some of these things, and maybe some of the good to be done when we look to sustainability, has to address questions of massive inequality of distribution of resources. Right. Um, I mean, New York may have a high density, but there's a bunch of empty $40 million apartments on Fifth Avenue that I hope someday gets seized, um, as well as inhuman living conditions in other parts of almost every metro area. It's not a, I don't think a surprise that Mumbai would shrink if we had that kind of <laughs> right. destiny, not because very rich people in Mumbai don't live with as much space as right. rich people in New York do, but how, I think that's an important part of sustainability and how 
do you think that needs to be addressed? Um, I wish I was a sociologist or... Um, um, that is an intractable problem. I don't know the answer to that. Um, it's, what you describe is not a problem just obviously in New York. Um, here in Jackson, um, I have students each year who, you know, or people who are coming into the fifth year program who ask, where can I live? And I always want to say, well, you, there's a lot of, there are a lot of buildings right here in downtown. I wish I could say you can live here. The handful of places that you can live in downtown Jackson, um, trying to forget that there's some real estate people in the opposite corner back there. Um, <laughs> the, a, a lot of the places you can live in downtown Jackson are owned by corporations. There are apartments that are placeholders that they use only when they bring in a special guest or want to throw a party. Um, and most, many of my students are literally priced out of any option in downtown. Um, and my students are clearly not even in the, you know, they're not even the, those with the greatest needs in the world. Um, equity is, is um, has such, a, such a huge problem. Um, I think in some way that there's a, it's political will. Much like the problem of trying to shrink a footprint um, of the city's urban footprint, um, some of these problems will just require cities coming up with innovative ways to control this, the unused buildings in a city. Um, I mean, if we could get all the buildings that are in downtown Jackson sort of up and running in the hands of people that might do something with them, downtown Jackson would be a different place. But it is a political problem that I am woefully um, unprepared to address. Time for, oh, all right. Time for one last question. Sort of following up on previous questions, has the Department of Archi or Division of Architecture at Mississippi State worked on developing guidelines either with the Carl Small Town Center or on y'all's on that cities might utilize if they were to look to develop a um, sustainable city or sort of go about that practice? And then sort of the second aspect of that, um, how to build sort of some sort of sustain some sort of sustainable structure that might outlast one administration um, <laughs> as opposed to just sort of you get one mayor elected but might have a short-term vision? Um, <clears throat> I, I know that uh, both our centers have done projects with many municipalities helping them to build, helping them create their own blueprint. Uh, I think they have struggled with exactly this political question of, the, the mayor or the city council that brings them in to write a blueprint uh, is often out of office by the time the blueprint is really in their hands and they're ready to act on it. Um, so I know that a lot of the, the development plans that the Gulf Coast Community Design Studio developed for Biloxi were implemented. Uh, I don't know if they're still in force today, uh, but right after Katrina, that was, Katrina was a sort of awful opportunity. Uh, because so much was destroyed that, that municipalities were reaching out to all sorts of academic institutions saying, help us figure out how to remake this place. Um, um, but the, the two centers, yes, do that kind of work. If I can point to a place where it has been ongoing, long-term successful, um, my understanding of the relationship with Biloxi is the most sustainable of those. Um, and in terms of making one generic guide for all cities. No, I, we have not done that. Thank you all for being here today. Don't forget to come back next week when George Milne will be our speaker. Um, we were not able to order copies of the book in time, but luckily, <laughs> Jason had a few that he was able to bring. So if you're interested in reading more about what he's talked about, We'll have these for sale right over here. Thank you all for being here. Help me thank Jason Callender for this really insightful talk today. <laughs>